Hello and welcome to the Autistic Me podcast. I am Christopher Scott Wyatt speaking as the Autistic Me. This episode, I am very honored to be joined by Roy Richard Grinker. Dr. Grinker is a professor of anthropology at George Washington University. Among his fields of research, cross-cultural understandings of mental health. As an anthropologist, he looks at how culture shapes our understanding of mental wellness. Dr. Grinker's earlier work, Unstrange Minds, really shaped my own dissertation and future research and even my continuing research in the fields of autism and economics. Dr. Grinker, it is an honor to invite you to the Autistic Me podcast. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I want to begin with introducing the book, Nobody's Normal. It is your new work, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. There, the title, Nobody's Normal. Can you explain what you mean by nobody? It was sort of an accident coming up with that title. I was talking to my students about uh, the prevalence of various uh, conditions, uh, giving them percentages, you know, what proportion of the population um, has depression, what proportion of the population has anxiety, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, as a student, I could see was calculating all of these figures in her head. She said, Dr. Grinker, isn't anybody normal anymore? And I, answer, I looked at her and I said, no, nobody's normal. Nobody's ever been normal. Normal is a concept that was created in order to have the abnormal, in order to enforce conformity. And it's about time that we got a good understanding of how that uh, concept has worked against our uh, better and mental health. You know, normal until the mid 20th century just meant average or even mediocre. Only in the mid 20th century did it become this idea of something to aspire to. The other word that stands out to me in the title is stigma. Yeah, yeah. There is a history of stigma, and it's very briefly studied uh, until recently. There wasn't a lot of stigma studies, for lack of a better description. Could you tell the listeners, where does this stigma come from as a label and a word? And in your text, you mentioned some of the early work uh, research on stigma. You know, the word stigma uh, comes from the you know ancient Greek term stigmato, which was a branding or a mark on the skin of a criminal or, or a slave. Um, and of course, uh, it's associated with Christ's crucifixion um, wounds. But in our times, stigma has come to mean the way in which we demean or, or marginalize or brand a person through a negative judgment or a negatively valued label. And the reason that I was interested in writing about stigma was because there were many works on stigma and guides on how to eradicate it and awareness campaigns to try to reduce uh, the stigma of many conditions. And those works, though, kind of presumed that stigma already existed. So I wanted to go back and I wanted to look back and say, well, where did it actually come from? As an anthropologist, I can tell you that every society in the world can find some way to stigmatize something, but it's always local, culturally distinctive. And what's distinctive about stigma in Western Europe and North America is that stigma comes from an idea that the ideal individual is a maximizer, is a producer, is a capitalist who is independent and autonomous, does not depend on others, who is accountable to nobody but himself. And when people depended on others, when they couldn't be that productive individual, they were isolated and shamed and often institutionalized. So stigma and mental illness are kind of invented together in the 18th century in Europe. In your historical overview, you mentioned the rise of Asylums and prisons, sort of a joint origin where we start with asylums and then get prisons. Stigma already begins as something associated with mental deficiency. Well, stigma starts with not fitting in. 
to the ideals. And by the end of the 1700s, just as an example in Paris, approximately 1% of the population was confined. But when these first asylums were built, they didn't really have prisons. The first asylums were prisons plus anybody else that didn't fit in. And so you had people with severe mental illnesses side by side with people who were impoverished, side by side with people who were criminals. And it was only when people gathered together in these large asylums that scientists and doctors for the first time were able to see a large enough group of people to try and create a typology and separate them out. So we don't get the first prisons in Western Europe until after the asylums. In the asylums, they could say, oh, well, these people are criminals and these people are seriously mentally ill. We should separate them out. And then they create prisons for the criminals and they create insane asylums for people with mental illnesses. When you were explaining how this occurred, a lot of this framing in your book is done as sections. And the first is capitalism. That's right. How does our emphasis then on productivity, on independence, how does that in our Western understanding lead to the stigmatization of mental illness? Well, you know, as the dad of a wonderful um, autistic woman, I can tell you that uh, I am constantly asked the question of, Will your child be able to live independently one day? Will your child be able to support herself financially one day? And, you know, those seem like pretty logical questions in our society, but they're not the questions that everybody asks everywhere in the world. I was interviewing one family who has a child with autism, quite uh, as a non-speaking uh, boy with autism in Namibia, and I asked the question, who's going to take care of your son you know, when, when you die, are you frightened about who will take care of him when, when you, mom and dad, have passed away? And they were just simply confused because they said, we're not all going to die at the same time. When we die, there will still be people here in the village. So I don't understand what you're talking about. In other words, there is a notion that uh, there is a collectivity. You know, I don't want to use the trite phrase, it takes a village, but it kind of fits, right? That when we see somebody who's dependent, when we see somebody who uh, has uh, needs that, uh, that don't fit into what we consider the ideal person in capitalism, we find ways to criticize and demean them and shame them. And so one way to get rid of the stigma of mental illness, one way to get rid of the stigma of disability in general is not just to say, Let's not stigmatize people, but let's go back and find out what are the roots? What are the historical roots and the cultural processes that have created that stigma in the first place? And are there factors that we can identify that over the course of history have reduced it or exacerbated it? I'm going to take a tangent because you have brought up this independence and this idea of productivity, especially as it relates to autism. My wife and I will do appearances together and people will ask, how do you feel taking care of your husband and your children? My wife is a wonderful engineer and technical writer. And it is true. She certainly earns the bulk of the income for our household. And because I am a male in our society, it is assumed that I am supposed to be more productive in terms of income. And this strikes us as a little strange, and we always try to explain. I know I didn't become a professor on my own. I know I didn't get through school on my own. I know that I will always need some assistance. I have a lot of deficiencies as the world sees them. Yet, when we speak to groups, that's what they focus on is, well, oh my gosh, you're not independent, and you're okay with it. Mm -hmm. And that definitely, uh, to me, seems cultural because when I speak to groups outside of the U.S. via Zoom or whatever, they seem far more comfortable with the idea that 
productivity isn't how I measure myself, or at least how I try not to measure myself. Yeah, I mean, our our self identity is very much shaped by our our work, what we do as as work, um, as individuals, and that can have really negative consequences. The stay at home parent is not a wage earner, right? So are they not leading a meaningful life? If we could reframe our ideals so that we could see that everyone, every human being is dependent on others, right? To be dependent is to be human. If we could change things so that we understood that there are many ways to lead a meaningful life and that productive doesn't just have to mean money, then I think we might you know, release some of that stigma. I want to tell you a story, actually. Um, I was with my daughter, and we were uh, trying to get her a job at a uh, drugstore. And uh, so she had a trial period, uh, and she was, um, she'd come in in the morning, and she'd clean up a little, and then she'd stock shelves. And we met with her supervisor in order to go over her tasks to make sure that she understood. And um, the first thing she said was, well, when I get here in the morning, I'm a cleaning lady. Um, I don't know why she used the term cleaning lady, but she did. And the manager kind of snapped back at her and said, you are not a cleaning lady. You are a retail associate. And it was a meaningful moment for me because it really captured the process by which we teach people that there are certain jobs that are valued and certain jobs that are not valued. It's the, it was a moment where somebody, a young person, was being taught by our society that there is a hierarchy of jobs and professions. I mean, it was interesting. It also had its moment of being a bit heartbreaking. I would add to this story that I've interviewed some families in this area in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia who have children who love their jobs, who have children with autism or Down syndrome and other conditions, and they, they have found work and they love it. Maybe it's bagging groceries. Maybe it's filing books at a, a library. And the parents are the ones who are upset about those jobs, not the people themselves. They love them. They love them. Is there anything wrong with somebody loving the job of bagging groceries? I'm, one woman loves it because she does a good job at it. She likes the regularity of it. She doesn't have to move around very much. And she likes the fact that the customers are repeat customers who come in and then they know her by name. And now that's a meaningful life. When you talk about meaningful life and disability, your reflection on deafness in the early chapters was fascinating to me. I have several colleagues who are deaf and they are wonderful professors. The deaf culture that has emerged seems to be recapturing something that you depict in your book as perfectly normal in isolation only a hundred years ago. Well, yeah, I'll, t I'll tell you um, the story um, briefly. It really comes from the work of uh, the historian Nora Gross, and uh, she did um, a history of Martha's Vineyard, you know, the island. Um, very close to Boston. And um, in the early settlement in the 18th century of that island, people didn't leave and they intermarried and they intermarried. And over time, the um, intermarriage kind of took its toll genetically and they um, developed hereditary deafness. And because they developed hereditary deafness, they had to communicate with each other. I mean, there was a point in time, I think up to a quarter or a third of all people had some degree of deafness. And at the time on the mainland, sign language was considered to be a savage, horrible, primitive way of communicating, and uh, deaf children were not taught sign language. Uh, but on the island, they developed their own sign language. And over the years, everyone spoke sign language, and they spoke sign language so much that if you asked people, was this, this person deaf or was this person's grandfather deaf, no one could remember they didn't always know who was deaf and who wasn't deaf because they were all able to communicate in sign language. And so it was an interesting thing. You know, it was culture 
the fact that they intermarried with each other that caused the biological condition of deafness. But then it was culture again that adapted to that biological condition by creating sign language. And we could say, in a sense, that no one really was deaf on that island. They thought that if you were deaf, it was just a variation of normality. It's just part of variation. And, you know, it also tells us something about what's sometimes called the social model of disability, that you're only disabled if the environment doesn't allow you to do what you want to do. One could say the person who's differently abled and uses a wheelchair isn't really disabled if there are ramps and elevators and other kinds of uh, accessibility. And that's sort of what we saw in Martha's Vineyard. It's a fascinating historical case. That society at Martha, in Martha's Vineyard adapted and accommodated to the point where it became normalized. And many of us with disabilities simply want it to be normalized. The thing about Martha's Vineyard is it wasn't, it wasn't like inclusion. It wasn't saying, well, um, you people who have a disability must adapt to us. It was the other way around. It was the people who were not hearing, who also had to adapt, I mean, who were hearing, uh, that had to adapt to the people who were not hearing. You know, sometimes when we talk about mainstreaming and inclusion and so on, there's a rhetoric of assimilation there that can be troubling to people. That, you know, the good person who's disabled is the person who uh, fits in and adapts. But the Martha's Vineyard case tells us that we all have to adapt to each other all the time. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm right here now talking to you wearing eyeglasses. I mean, this is a disability, right? Because I have poor vision, so I wear eyeglasses. And we've normalized that to a, a bit. People will sometimes say, oh, I like your glasses. We need to also get to the place where people can compliment others on their hearing aids or compliment someone on their wheelchair. We don't usually do that. We're there with glasses. We're not there with, with other uh, forms of um, accommodation. I'm just thinking of my oldest and she just got a new pair of glasses and she was concerned with how good they would look. <laughs> her, her thought was not, I need glasses. Her thought was, how can I choose the best looking, coolest frames? And, and you're right. That's a very different approach than uh, being ashamed of having glasses. So uh, there are some wonderful uh, designers and engineers who are starting to, to try to refashion prosthetics and wheelchairs and other sorts of things to to make them beautiful so that they're not they don't look like medical devices you know what i mean yeah it is interesting how we how we stigmatize something and then when we realize that everyone's involved or a a lot of people have glasses obviously as they get older it seems to affect almost a majority of older americans so then glasses become less stigmatized i want to go back now towards your personal connection, in fact, that is the labeling of mental illness. We've talked about how things get labeled and how they're culturally constructed. You come from a, a family of psychiatrists? Yeah, my great-grandfather was a psychiatrist. My grandfather was a psychiatrist. My father was a psychiatrist. And my wife is a psychiatrist. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, psychiatry in my family. And um, it is a little bit odd that I didn't go into psychiatry um, personally. Um, you know, I really think it was that I was very insecure and I felt that my father and my grandfather, I never knew my great grandfather, were giants in their field. And, and I was intimidated and I didn't want to compete with them. So I, I, I sought a way to emphasize my differences. It's kind of a Darwinian principle, you know, that you, you don't compete with somebody else by being like them, you compete by emphasizing your differences. And that's sort of what I did by uh, staking out a career in a very, very different field, a non-clinical one, and also to do it internationally. What fascinates me is you are connected to individuals who were involved in the early stages of developing these socially constructed labels. 
you point out one of my conditions is diabetes and it is a construct. What blood sugar, what glucose reading is diabetic and which one isn't is a number. You mentioned hypertension in the text. These are numbers and they, they set a line and say, this is a label we're going to give at this point. Everything in mental illness in mental health care is a label guided by the DSM and its various revisions or the ICD. How does this evolve? How do we start labeling and how do those labels become so powerful in our culture? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, labels are a double-edged sword, right? You, on the one hand, um, labels can be used to demean, to marginalize, to, to isolate, to punish, discipline. These labels that have evolved, where do they come from and how do they, how have they become so powerful? Uh, whether it's schizophrenia, depression, mania, autism, these were all preceded by other labels and those were preceded by yet other labels and those labels have power. So how did those labels evolve from one thing to another, to another? And in some ways they seem to get increasingly powerful over time. So Today, they control everything from insurance to special services. Where do these labels start and who gives them all this power? Other than us, we give them the power. <laughs> we give them the power. Yeah, you know, when you develop uh, a body of expertise or a body of literature or a, a, a group of professionals, they have to have something that they do that's different from something somebody else does. And they create categories and classifications of things. And, you know, the, the typologies uh, will come from that particular historical moment. So, for example, when World War I started in Europe and in the United States, uh, doctors talked about people who had uh, traumatic um, psychological trauma from the war. They talked about them as having hysteria. But people experience that word hysteria as feminizing and therefore a sign of weakness, an assault on their masculinity. So they came up with a new term, shell shock. And then shell shock became used to classify people. And that was not a stigmatizing term. But once World War I ends, anybody who still had shell shock was seen to be a malingerer, a weakling, uh, not to be resilient. And so it became stigmatized again. So there is also a kind of intersectionality here uh, where in the war, people who were officers could be diagnosed with shell shock, but uh, people who were already members of discriminated groups like African-Americans in the US or the Irish in England, they were not given the dignity of having a shell shock diagnosis and were continued uh, to be diagnosed with hysteria. So it's really, really complicated here. Um, and labels are really a double-edged sword. On the one hand, they can be used to, to demean and to discriminate, like saying that a person who's Irish versus English had hysteria. And yet they also drive services because, and interventions and treatments, because these, these categories are also frameworks for understanding a particular set of symptoms. Where things get really difficult is when labels change the way we behave, when we start to see ourselves through that lens, and it becomes almost a form of self-discipline. One of the great examples of this is a famous book by a sociologist named Smith called The Making of Blind Men, in which he studied young men who went into a school for the blind, but who had residual vision. Once they went into the school for the blind and they were labeled blind, they no longer used the residual vision that they had. They stopped using their vision at all. They had now seen themselves as blind. The psychiatric labels come about because people are put in asylum. So there are a lot of people to study and they start creating these statistical matrices of human behavior because of urbanization, the asylums, the prisons, the hospitals, 
So in some ways, it seems that psychiatry evolves out of the moment of the Enlightenment and then the Industrial Revolution. Is that a misreading of what you're trying to cover in those early chapters? No, I think it's it's correct. What the early chapters are doing in Nobody's Normal is to try to articulate the way in which the terms uh, that we have developed to um, divide up human beings emerged out of a complex set of factors that included the economy, that included kinship, and of course, the ideology of capitalism as well. And, you know, it's notable that um, before, uh, before abolition in the 19th century, there was a mental illness term called drapetomania. Drapetomania was defined as a mental illness characterized by the desire of a slave to be free. I mean, that was, <laughs> that was a mental illness label. Um, in the late 19th century, somebody who was gay, um, though that word didn't exist, but say a man who, 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 who loved men, who was sexually attracted to man, a woman who was sexually attracted to a woman, um, there was no term to define that separately from any other kind of sex that was generally disapproved of. At the same time, there was no term to define sex that was approved of versus that which wasn't. And so we only see the development, the invention of the terms homosexuality and heterosexuality in 1892, that recent. And the word homosexuality is so new that it didn't even enter the Oxford English Dictionary until 1976. So before that time, there was no label other than perversion or abnormality, you know, something of that sort. But there was no sort of kind of person that existed. What happened with the invention of all of these labels over the course of the past couple of hundred years is that we've created actually new kinds of human beings. So, you know, if a man was loving a man back in the uh, early 1800s, he might have been afraid that he'd be found out, but he wasn't afraid of being called a homosexual. The act was what was disapproved of, but there wasn't an identity yet. What labels have done is created identities, sometimes and mostly for worse, but sometimes for good too. We've seen certain labels that we've taken ownership of and redefined for positive uses. The labels. I'm thinking like neurodiversity, the LBGTQ. Yeah, these are the positive ones I've been thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. When they take ownership and create their own labels, I notice, at least with within autism, the autistic community often avoids autistic and goes with neurodiverse. I know that other communities have taken to capitalizing their term, like the deaf community will capitalize deaf. So taking ownership of those labels and trying to maybe not destigmatize them entirely, but to take ownership of them so they don't control the community, but the community controls the language. Yeah, well said. You know, what it means to take ownership of it is to define it yourself and not have it defined for you. To have some agency, you know, to have the ability to, um, uh, to define yourself by yourself. That's what we want to be able to do. When I'm looking at how some of these early words were used, you you cover hysteria, lunacy, several others that are, in today's world, we would certainly recognize they're misogynistic at best. Yeah. Psychiatry has a lot of baggage with uh, racism, classism, and gender bias. And now we see that in autism. They'll talk about the male brain. Mm, um, yeah. I'm sure you you've seen some of these research papers that talk about the maleness of the female autistic. Why did this happen in psychiatry? Why do you think psychiatry had this cultural baggage that it then tried to relabel as science? Well, it depends what historical period we're talking about, because the way in which maleness and femaleness have been dealt with in the psychological professions have, have varied over time. But uh, in Nobody's Normal, one of the things that I talk about is the 
separation of men and women over the course of the last couple of hundred years into men as cultural beings and women as tied to nature, their emotions, their uh, physical um, uh, processes, whether it's menstruation or menopause or um, breastfeeding, childbirth, become seen as closely tied to nature. And so the very early psychiatrists and psychologists, the very early ones really thought that women were more susceptible to problems of change and cycles of nature than men were. In fact, the word lunacy comes from moon, right? And uh, menstruation comes from month and time. And so um, women were thought to be much more prone to mental illnesses because they did not have the reason and the logic to control their emotions, whereas men could. And so there was a, a division that developed over time in which there was um, a kind of gendered difference uh, in the study of mental illness. Also in the, the, the book, you mentioned that we started dividing the body and the mind, not just among men and women and how women were perceived as natural and, and somewhat primitive, almost incomplete. But we also then separated the body from the mind. Yes. Can you explain how this occurred? Because when someone feels sick because they're anxious, when someone has, uh, as many autistics do, I suffer physical symptoms in social situations. And then someone will say, yes, but it's all in your mind. Mm -hmm. You address this in the text, and I, I hope everyone reads that, because you really address this dividing of mind and body. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's an age-old philosophical question, right, about the relationship between the mind and the body. But you know, the very first psychiatrists, the precursors of psychiatry, were called alienists. And what was alienated? The mind was alienated from the body. The body was alienated from the mind. And uh, the mental illness in the early days in France was, was mental alienation, you know, alienation mental. And over time, a lot of the stigma of mental illness has been um, reaffirmed and reinforced by the idea that there are either physical illnesses or there are mental illnesses, and the two don't meet. And we know that's an illusion. We know that's false. We know that physical illnesses have psychological consequences, profound ones. We know that psychological experiences like emotions can have physical consequences and even change the architecture of the brain. So it makes no sense really to separate the two. But we do so to the degree that many people who experience physical symptoms that are of partly psychological origin or psychological symptoms that are partly of physical origin, reject the idea that they're related. And when somebody comes to a doctor with anxiety, and you know, anxiety is common, we all have anxiety. Anxiety is normal, right? If we didn't have anxiety, we would you know, get hit by cars on the street all the time because we wouldn't be looking. Um, but if you have anxiety um, about something, you may experience that anxiety through stomach aches or through feeling flushed, or through having a, um, an elevated heart rate. But if a doctor says to somebody that this physical symptom that you have, maybe you should see some, a mental health professional to help you with that, experiences that comment as saying, snap out of it, you're making it up, it's not real. Uh, the separation of body and mind has really reinforced this notion that there are real illnesses and fake ones. That's a problem. That's a big problem. It's a big barrier to mental health care. In the chapter, you talk about the body speaking and then being ignored. And I think that's a great way to describe it because I suffer from sensory overload and I also have tremors. The reaction is, well, we did an MRI. There's nothing wrong. It's it's all in your head. You need to 
well, it's just all in your head. Maybe it'll just go away. Not once did the doctor doing the MRI say, maybe you should talk with your neuropsychiatrist about this, your neuropsychologist about this. It was, well, I can't find anything wrong in the MRI, so it's not a problem. Right, right. And, and you do a wonderful job of explaining how the separation disease then becomes of the body and mental illness is just something else that we either don't talk about or we push off to the side. Yeah, there, I do. Um, I have a quote uh, in the the book that serves as the epigraph for um, one of the chapters from the famous 19th century doctor, Henry Maudsley. And I, I love the, his line. He says, the sorrow that has no vent in tears makes other organs weep, which is, I think of, of a, a lovely way of, of putting it. Um, most societies in the world, you know, they, they, they don't express their, emotional distress through a rich language of emotion laden terms. They express their emotional distress through, through the body. Um, and if they do think about the brain, if they do think about emotion, it can be very embarrassing and shameful and highly stigmatizing. And I tell the story of a Nepalese uh, doctor who um, in a rural area of Nepal uh, put a kind of mobile clinic up and he said, this is a mobile clinic for people with depression and other mental illnesses. And no one showed up. And then he went back to the same area and he put up a sign that said, this is a clinic for headaches. And there was a line, long, long line of people waiting to get into the clinic. And he said, they were really depressed and they were really anxious and they had mental illnesses. But I had to call it a headache to get them to come in because otherwise it would have been too stigmatizing. You mentioned that even today, some of the mental health guides discuss, I believe it was uh, Korean, the uh, burning. Hua Byung, yes, the sort of internal fire. It's a, a Korean, particularly Korean condition in which anxiety is experienced as a kind of um, burning uh, or painful sensation in the abdomen. We're all familiar with getting a knot in our stomach when we're nervous or sweaty palms, and, and yet we seem to not understand or not want to embrace the idea that it's a it's a holistic experience mental health is holistic it's not just in my thoughts it is in my body i write in the book about how my grandfather after world war ii started a, a large research institute with 95 researchers at a cost of uh, opened it in 1951 at a cost of two million dollars don't know what that would be in today's dollars and the goal was to study the interaction between mind and body, the interaction between physical and psychological aspects of humanity. And his patients were mostly people who had cancer or hypertension or other kinds of conditions that had real psychological consequences. But equally, they did look at how people with mental illnesses could develop things that we can't even you know, most of us imagine, but there could be people who had blindness that was of psychological origin, people who were um, paralyzed, had a, their arm was paralyzed, or they were mute. Um, the brain is a powerful organ, you know, and, and uh, it can have a dramatic effect. And we then experience or express our symptoms in the way that makes sense to our community. You know, we're not going to experience symptoms that don't make sense. So in sub-Saharan Africa, I have a whole section on genital theft in sub-Saharan Africa, where people uh, experience intense anxiety by believing that their genitals are being stolen. That makes total sense, given the conditions that I write about, that they would feel that way, that they would convey their symptoms in that way. But in another society, they don't express their anxiety through that. In the United States, the idea that your anxiety, you know, that you that someone is sort of magically stealing your genitals, that doesn't make sense to us. So we don't express our anxiety that way. We express it in other ways. We only have a few minutes left and I want to conclude with the the concept of spectrum. Because we now talk about the autism spectrum and by putting things on a spectrum, I just finished reading 
Professor Cheek's work on introversion and extroversion, and he talks about a spectrum. And so the word spectrum is now entering the mental health field. How does accepting everything as a spectrum instead of just on or off, a binary, how has this improved how we see mental health? I think the nice thing about the idea of a spectrum is that it takes us away from this idea that you either have something or don't have it, right? You're autistic or you're not autistic. You're depressed or you're not depressed. And it's very simplistic and very async, you know, it's very synchronic, right? Um, the idea of a spectrum helps us see that we all, all humans exist on a con- on, on continua, but it also helps us kind of understand that we change over time. And once labeled, you're not always going to be labeled. Um, the DSM is now talking about bipolar disorder on a spectrum and schizophrenia on a spectrum and all kinds of, uh, of, of spectrums, which I, I think is very, has been very much influenced by the neurodiversity movement, you know, where, where this really started in the first place. Um, I think the spectrum is an invitation to be a human and to say, nobody's normal, you know, to say that uh, the way you are right now may not be the way you are five years from now or even tomorrow. This is not to say that diagnoses are unwarranted. Diagnoses are important. We have to be able to make important judgment calls of when shyness becomes autism, when sadness becomes depression, when anxiety shifts in degree so much that it is affecting your work life, your social life, uh, causing you uh, to have significant impairments in your daily functioning. And then those diagnoses become important because at that point you're, you are sick and you need help and you deserve help. The concept of help goes back to stigma. When we value independence and we value productivity, we look at seeking help as a weakness. What you're suggesting is that by being on a spectrum, you can you can say someone needs a little help, someone needs more help. It somehow makes it less less stigmatizing to have that spectrum. Yeah, I mean, I I I know you stopped for me to add to it, but I think you said it beautifully. It's a wonderful book. Nobody's normal, really helps those of us who who deal with these labels and live with these labels and have to respond to these labels. It helps us understand where they originated, how they were shaped by capitalism, by war, by the DSM itself and its evolutions, by psychiatry's culture. And I think it's fair to say that mental health has a, the mental health professions are a culture. Absolutely. And they differ from uh, region to region, country to country, and and certainly time to time. Each era seems to carry its own changes to the field. I really, really enjoy the book. Again, it's Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. I, I want to leave on a positive note. You seem to imply in the book, though, that it's possible to move beyond stigma. So where do you see us going? Well, there will always be ways of shaming somebody demeaning somebody, negatively valuing them. But we need to identify when it happens and see if we can change it. We can shape it. Because stigma is not something that we are born to do. It's not something that's in our genes. Stigma is something that we create in our culture and that we teach our, 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 the members of our culture. And if we've created it, we certainly are going to have the power to change it. I just love that, that we, we can choose it. We can change how we approach other people. If all of us approach other people with openness and understanding, that's what changes society. Our individual choices to be less judgmental, less prejudicial. Do you have time for me to say a few more things? Oh, absolutely. I want to talk a little bit about how change can happen very, very quickly. Uh, And I saw this in South Korea. When I first went to South Korea to study autism, I couldn't even get people to find me somebody with autism or a parent of a child with autism because it was just so incredibly uh, stigmatizing. And today, South Koreans have embraced the idea 
that there is an autism spectrum and that autism involves challenges as well as strengths. Now, I'm kind of a fan of Korean dramas. They're a bit, you know, formulaic, but if you like Korean dramas, you, you know, you like Korean dramas. And there's this drama that um, I just finished watching called It's Okay Not to Be Okay. Um, the Korean title actually uh, is Saiko uh, Jiman uh, Kenchana, which means it's okay to be psycho. So not a very good title in Korean, but a great translation in English. It's okay not to be okay. And I was watching it on Netflix. And it's, it's pretty much a story of a, a young man whose older brother is autistic. And the young man is always feeling burdened that he's taking care of his older brother who has autism. But by the end of the 10 or 12 episodes or whatever there is, the young man actually realized that it's his older brother who's disabled that's been taking care of him. And that the relationship of uh, of the, of this, you know, hierarchy of the caregiver and the 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 person receiving care, it gets reversed, and we start to see that this man with autism has many skills that his brother doesn't have, and a level of intelligence that his brother doesn't have, despite the fact that he's his symptoms are quite involved, and uh, it's a fascinating drama. It's also an evidence of how things can change so quickly in a society. Uh, many people who are listening to this podcast must be familiar with the TV show The Good Doctor uh, in the United States, but that was a Korean show that then was purchased by Hollywood to make into uh, an American one. It was originally Korean. Remarkable change, remarkable speed. And when you talk about autism in other cultures, I certainly saw this in other places I've lived and worked in both Fresno, California and Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, there are significant uh, Hmong communities and Somali communities and their view of autism and their fears of autism were very different than the white middle class that I was typically seeing. And so they had, even within a nation, our different communities can perceive things differently. And I am very glad to see changes about mental health, especially autism within the black community, the Hispanic, the Hmong, as autism becomes less stigmatized in those communities. Yeah, I've been doing work um, with a group at Florida State University uh, directed by um, Amy Weatherby. And um, she runs a big project trying to figure out how to balance or equalize ages of diagnosis of autism and the delivery of services. Because even today, um, a black child is going to be diagnosed with autism significantly later than his or her white counterpart. And there is a bias among educators and doctors to diagnose among African Americans things like conduct disorder uh, instead of autism. And there is a definitely a, a, a racist um, and kind of institutionalized or structured bias within the medical system that changes the way the diagnoses are employed and the way special education services are delivered. And that has to be addressed as well. We certainly see this in disciplinary statistics in both K-12 and university uh, settings in the United States. Yes. African-American students are far more likely to be diagnosed by school psychologists with oppositional uh, behavior disorders instead of being referred to further evaluation for uh, neurodiversity. It is interesting. Also, I will say as a parent, our, our daughters are adopted. And while they were in foster care, the diagnoses were uh, RAD, which is attachment disorder. Now that they are adopted and live with us and have the same behaviors, they're like, we really should do an autism spectrum screening. Yeah, it's interesting that they had a, a diagnosis of reactive attachment disorder because there has been um, a lot of 
kind of a, a kind of value, I suppose, for that diagnosis in South Korea because. Uh, if you have a child with reactive attachment disorder, it means that uh, the child has these symptoms because of poor parenting or pathological caretaking in it. And, and why would that be desirable? Because it takes the blame off the parent's genetic line. And so sometimes in South Korea, a parent is willing to say, hey, it's not my family, my lineage, my genes there's nothing wrong with my other children. I was just a bad parent to this one child. And so this diagnosis gets misused as a way to protect the kind of genetic integrity of the family. It's very interesting. I obviously could spend a lot of time discussing all of your work. It's fascinating the breadth you cover just as a researcher, uh, the research in Africa, the research uh, that you did that was so personal in unstrange minds, and now nobody's normal. I really enjoy and appreciate this opportunity to discuss your work with you. Thank, I appreciate it, Dr. Grinker, very much, and I know my audience will appreciate well, thank it. Thank you for your kind words and this wonderful interview. I really enjoyed ch chatting with you. Well, thank you. And listeners, you've been listening to the Autistic Me podcast. I want to encourage you to get your copy of Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. It will be available online, I'm sure, at Amazon and Barnes & Noble and everywhere else that is available during this pandemic. It is available pretty much everywhere. And I should emphasize that it is um, an audio book. Um, it is also a regular hardcover book. And I think it's $20 on Amazon. And it is also a Kindle book. So you can get it as an ebook, as a spoken book, as as um hardcover. And I really, you know, if people read the book and you like the book, please let me know. Please let Amazon or Goodreads know and um, you know, any review or comment uh really really helps the author. Your books are so excellent at conveying complex ideas in such approachable in eloquent language. You are a, a fantastic storyteller. And I think that anthropologists and historians are among our best storytellers. Thanks for saying that. Uh, you're too kind. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time and your generosity. Again, I, I cannot thank you enough for being on the Autistic Me podcast. Thank you, Dr. Grinker. Take care. Be well.